Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Baseball Podcast. It is me, Joey P., Joe Pizapia, and today we continue our week of all teams, and today it's all about the breakouts. That's right. The guys are going to take their game from here and bring it all the way up to here. And to help me break these players down, of course, is the Welsh, Chris Welsh, and one of the best Welsh. baseball writers on the planet. He is the host of the Beat the Shift podcast. He also is pretty much like Fantasy Writer of the Year every single year. Uh, not to mention, he does a little production system called ATC. It's Ariel no Cohen. Ariel, uh, did you project yourself being on this show here today? Uh, absolutely. I, I uh, yeah. projected it would be a fantastic show, and we know that's going to happen, right? Look at that. It's already in the bank, Welsh. So really, it's all on you if it fails. Well, usually. <laughs> yeah, when it fails, it's like, hey, Welsh, what the hell were you doing? Uh, we've seen that recently. Ariel, are you in a uh, who wants to be a millionaire background? What, what is your background you got going on here? He is. Is the background? Yeah. Oh, he's You're, actually uh, there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Who wants to be a millionaire? Of course. That's the, oh, okay. Uh, Regis Philbin, of course. That, that was a classic. That started the whole revolution of game shows on TV. That You didn't have them for decades, and all of a sudden that started it. I love okay. it. I, I love Just when it popped on today. And this is why you watch on the YouTube channel, because you can see Arrow Co. in there. It's uh, <clears throat> right there, ready for Regis to ask him a question. So does that mean I have to talk like this the rest of the show? Oh, are we going? We're going to ask all these questions? You know, one thing to just throw out real quick, I know we want to get into this quickly, but I just want to give a shout out. Uh, ATC was voted as, and there's always this debate because obviously mm -hmm. ATC is an aggregate projection system, but there's also a lot of heart and soul put into it by Ariel. So there's this debate of like, Ariel's projections that are an aggregate versus the bad X, which was the highest individual projection system put up. But Ariel's ATC was rated as the most accurate projection system. And I believe this has gone on for a couple years here. And you've got some new uh, some new stuff. I think you've aligned with a few new people. So, I mean, ATC, I'm a big averages type of person. Uh, I'm not and funny enough. I'm not like the most hardcore per, um uh, projections type of person, but yeah, I like to I take watch. a look at the highs and lows of things and kind mm -hmm. of find the middle ground. And ATC does a good job about that. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about just real quick, the accuracy that ATC has had over the last couple of years and, uh, you know, just how the whole thing has been spitting out and what you're looking at this year. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is the fourth year in a row that fantasy pros has dubbed me as the most accurate projection. So, well, you know, we'll take that. Um, and, you know, it shows uh, that uh, we're getting into more places. People are trusting it. It's a household name. I mean, uh, you know, Derek Cardi actually uses ATC playing time within his own projection. Uh, he trusts that now. So uh, very excited. And, uh, hey, it's let's make it five in a row, right? Let's there you go. go. Just keep on going. Uh, the dynasty continues. Real quick, I want to ask the projection master, what do you think about stolen bases this year? I know you and I were kind of talking about, you know, the pitch clock, the the ability to only throw over being limited by the pitchers now. What do you think kind of impact wise you're going to see in stolen bases? Are we going to see a major uptick here potentially in 2023? Yeah, well, the uptick was already starting this past year where we had that really low two years ago, and uh, it, it already started going. Uh, yeah, you're going to see more of that. The question, though, is it going to be at the top of the curve? It's going to be, you know, the Jorge Mateos and the Mondesi is going to 60, or is it just going to be a bunch of 10 stolen base guys going to 15, 20? That remains to be seen. I think uh, stolen bases is always uh, manager's call. It's opportunity. Are you stealing uh, when you have the chance? So it remains to be seen. But, yes, it's going to be up all around. You're, you're going to see, I'm not going to say gigantic, but you're going to see very significant change. And it has to do mostly with the pickoff rule that pretty much it's just one pickoff and you're done. Well, we should have done this yesterday when Colette was on here, but Colette put out this really great tweet after the first week that was breaking down percentages and, and what it was, was, and you probably saw it, it was what spring training stolen base numbers do compared to in season. And it was usually like a 20% decrease from what you see in spring training, except the first week, the numbers were the highest stolen base attempts in spring training since 2012, I believe it was 10, 11 years. So that inherently was showing that we were going to see a massive increase over the last couple, though I do feel like the last week and a half or so stolen bases have kind of tapered down. I don't believe there's a single player with over two stolen bases in spring training. So I've got that down a little bit. At the end of the day, the math that Colette put out was like a 25% increase. Do you believe we will see a 20 to 25% stolen base increase across the whole league? You said you don't know if it'll be the top guys or the middle guys, but do you think we'll see like an overall 20 to 25% stolen base increase? No, I think that's way too high a number. I think we're going to get closer to 10, 15, uh, maybe 20. That's, that's the capper. Um, you know, I, I don't really trust the spring training stats. So first of all, the first week, they're trying every which way to do everything new. 
Um, I'm I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna rely on it. And by the way, uh, because of the WBC, you have a lot of major league players not in spring training, so spring mm-hmm. training stats in general are gonna be pretty murky. I would not put any any emphasis on that. But uh, yeah, the answer to the question again, no, that that seems too high. I'd say closer to 15, maybe 20. All right, let's get to the breakouts here. Let's start with catcher. The boys here put together their all breakout team. The guys who are going to take their game to the next level. So, Ariel Cohn, a catcher, who's taking the field for you? All right, we're going to go with uh, Logan Ohapi. Yes, it's pronounced like sloppy Ohapi. Uh, <laughs> he the uh, the breakout here. I always you always want to have a reason for the breakout, and this reason is playing time. Last year, Sean Murphy just completely came onto the field and bursted onto value because he got so many more at bats than what everyone predicted. And I think that's the case with with Ohapi here. Uh, he's got a nice base of power. His average. 241 I'm projecting, which is actually pretty good for what would be a second catcher. Uh, The ATC volatility metrics show low volatility. Like we have a very good idea of what he is. Um, And who's in front of him? Max Stassi? Stassi had a 180 average last year. I can't see him being a threat. I think you're going to see by the end of the year, Ohapi being the the main catcher and whatever people have projected for him, he's going to pass it. I can see him getting the lion's share. So Ohapi, because of the at-bats, is going to be a good fantasy buy. Well, sh- at your bachelor party, didn't you have a sloppy Ohapi? I want to say you did. <laughs> we don't talk about that. We don't talk about what happened at the bachelor parties. Sloppy Ohapis okay. or not, Joe. Thank you very yeah. much. Well, it's interesting because this is the same player a few weeks back. We had Frank Stample on the show, and he was very high on Ohapi as well. So when smart people are all talking about the same players, everybody should take notice. Welsh, who is your catcher for the all breakout team of 23? I would have picked Logan Ohapi, Sloppy Ohapi, had uh, I been given the opportunity. <laughs> I'm never going to not think of him with that name now. Thanks, Ariel. Not now. You Thanks, you me. ruined it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The uh, the guy I picked was Tyler Stevenson with the Cincinnati Reds. It's actually a very similar situation. You want to talk about, like, you're looking at playing time. Give me a catcher that comes at a cheap cost. I, I think I said this yesterday. I don't want a catcher inside my top 100. No, thanks. It's immediate bus territory for me. Even if they produce well, I don't want to get that cost because I think there's a lot of good value later. But if you're talking about breakouts, I don't really think William Contreras fits the breakout who's someone I would want, Sean Murphy. But Tyler Stevenson specifically does. Tyler Stevenson suffered from some injuries last year, was not able to get a full season in. They're also talking about him playing a significant amount of games at first base. You've got injuries with Joey Votto. So he's going to be playing kind of all across the board. Fun fact as well, did you know he is projected with the third best batting average in ATC projections. Give me a high batting average on a catcher who makes really good contact skills, 16 homers on ATC projections that I think he can get 20 plus. He's going to hit closer to a middle of the lineup for the Reds and his cost is outside the top 10 catchers. As a matter of fact, 168 on the aggregate ADP on fantasy pros. That's a pretty good volume, which is boosted up because of NFBC. NFBC is screwing that up a little bit. It's probably closer to 200. So give me a closer that's going to hit inside the top five of a lineup with playing time, move different positions, has 20 plus power and top five best batting average projections on ATC. Mwah. Let's go. I like it. I don't know about you guys, but I mean, certainly for the listeners here, I'm sure they would love to have the Welsh or Ariel Cohn inside the draft with them. They love to have all the experts with them. And we could do that for you at Fantasy Pros. So the draft assistant is the ultimate tool for dominating your fantasy baseball draft. And what it does is basically syncs up to your draft and you can have the cheat sheets, which we've talked about before in the show. You can take your favorite experts, put those in there to the draft assistant with sync. But what's so great about the draft assistant, if you've seen our uh, shows here at Fantasy Pros. When we do our mock draft shows. You'll see all the times where it gives you recommendations on players. It tells you who <clears throat> is picking after you and already has certain positions filled. And that's huge because that's the difference of you making the right pick at the right time and not. And making those right picks are everything when you're going into the draft. And if you want to go ahead and get a, a piece of this, you get that MVP or Hall of Fame subscriber situation over at Fantasy Pros because when you get that, then you have all the tools at your disposal. But I, I, Got to tell you, if you go to fantasypros.com slash premium today, you sign up, you go MVP, or you go Hall of Fame and get the whole kit and caboodle. I'm telling you right now, that is the key to going in there and crushing all your drafts, especially if you have multiple drafts, because that software, our team is so good. They put together incredible expert advice. It gives you the right pick at the right time with the analysis after the drafts. Well, Welsh always does that also on all the shows. They always plug in their teams afterwards, but you don't want to do that afterwards. You want to be there live with the tools. You can only get that 
Again, Fantasy Baseball Draft Wizard app. So go crush the competition. Download it and check out fantasybros.com slash premium. Go premium today. And don't forget, you can manage all your lineups from Fantasy Pros. That's right. You got 10 leagues. You can set all your lines in one place. Ariel Cohen has like 20 leagues. I'm sure that's a very useful thing for him. He should be using the tools if he's not, especially since he's like number one guy at Fantasy Pros every year. So here we go. Ariel Cohen, let's go for the first baseman for the breakout 2023 team. Who is it? All right, we're going to go with Cleveland Guardians first baseman Josh Naylor. And there's plenty of room for him to play either first or even at DH. Uh, Last year, he was amazing. 20 homers, 79 RBIs, even stole six bases. We know stolen bases are going up, so it could even be 8-10. You never know. Decent average. I'm projecting him for 265 batting average. The thing about uh, picking some of these guys is that players who bat in the middle of the lineup and the Guardians are going to be a decent lineup. They've got Rosario in there, Jimenez, Josh Bell now. Um, you're going to have a lot of runs in RBIs. That's 40, 40% of your Roto statistics are runs in RBIs. And he's got the power and he's got some speed and, and some average. So this is a guy with, uh, with that. And I think he's relatively safe. Look at his strikeout rate. Last year, 16% strikeout rate. And that's been a long track. I mean, he's been under 20 every single year of his career, pretty much. So uh, we're talking about uh, a safe guy who's going to get a lot of stats, and nobody's paying for him. He's going like the 16th, 17th round of drafts all day. Uh, It's amazing because we do so many drafts here in the mocks, and this is a player that keeps falling, and I keep stashing him as like an extra utility guy. I mean, I just – I don't get it, Ariel. I'm with you 100% on Nailer, and I've been picking him up. And every time I do, the Draft Wizard gives me that little a little clap, the little mm. golf clap, which is, yeah. you know, I need that. I need my self-esteem is very low. Welsh, let's go to your first baseman. Who is it? And this is a player, too, that we talked about a little yesterday. Yeah, I try to talk about him pretty much wherever I can. I, and I actually slid him over to this spot because most places he is going to qualify at third base. It's Jose Miranda, who is one of my favorite late guys. You know, I, I use the term, I believe it was last year, where Ty France was kind of a glue piece. There's these players that maybe they're not exceptional in a lot of different areas, but I feel like everything that they do really work for the game. And I, I view Jose Miranda as a glue piece, but I also think there's just a ton of upside. One of my favorite things I've cited a gajillion times over, but if you're new listening, is his approach last year year in two strike counts was better than most people in the league. It was two of the three two strike counts you can have. He hit over 300. The other was 240. And that was better than Mookie Betts kind of across the board. It, it's a kind of ironically weird stat, but it just showed the plate presence, which I love about him because he's a sub 20% K guy, which I think is huge for his game as he continues to grow. The baseball savant sheet doesn't necessarily jump out to you, but he had a 42% hard hit rate. I think the power is going to jump up. Max EV was right around 110 this past year. His XBA was a little bit lower than his actual batting average, but it was still in line. And this is a great lineup for him to put up run and RBI numbers. Plus he's going to qualify at third base. I think Jose Miranda has a real, real chance to be 20 plus homers with 80, 80 on the run and RBI and hit 270 to 280. He's not going to steal a whole lot of bases, but he's going to provide you pretty high end on the other four categories. Homers being a little bit of question that I think he's ready for a breakout regardless. And it's first and third that he qualifies at. So that's going to be my pick here. Love Miranda. Another guy I think is just super undervalued and not getting enough press right now. Uh, let's go to the second base situation here. Back to you, Ariel. Who's the second baseman that's a potential to break out in 2023? Right back to your twins there. Nick Gordon. <laughs> Nick Gordon, the brother of formerly Major League Baseball player D. Gordon. Uh, this guy has a lot of potential. And by the way, he also qualifies in the outfield. So if you have him your team, you can move him and use him as you speak. Uh, Power-speed combo. We're talking a guy who... Uh, can put up 10, 10, maybe even 20, 20. I can see that happening uh, even this year. And the batting average won't be thrilling, but it's not going to be terrible. He's got a 23% strikeout rate, so not a lead or anything, but major league average. Uh, the question is playing time. Will he play enough? Well, he played 400 at bats last year, and let's see who's on the team. Well, they shipped Luis Arias out to clear room at second base for him. That's good. How about in the outfield? Well, you got Byron Buxton. Sure, Byron Buxton never gets hurt, so I'm sure he will. <laughs> right? Earmuffs, uh, Welsh. Earmuffs. Rude. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that, but uh, it is true. Sorry, I just go by history. Uh, so we're talking about a high-skilled <laughs> player. I like to bet on high-skilled players. You know who this reminds me of? Or at least the, 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 not exactly in profile, but in terms of skills. Uh, DJ LeMay, who uh, in terms of value, <laughs> I always said, hey, are the Yankees going to play him? Probably looks like they'll play him four days, three days. But you know what? High skilled players get to play, and he did. 
Uh, Nick Gordon is a high skilled player. I don't think that he's going to be stopped. So he's going to benefit from that. And uh, he could really help your team down the stretch if you need to fill in those extra homers and stolen bases at about pick 300. Yeah, I mean, gosh, in terms of the ADP, too, I mean, he's talking about free players. Uh, he had 400 at bats last year, as you were saying. Is this another player, too, Arrow, that, you know, because of the athleticism, could be another guy where those six stolen bases and 136 games could double or maybe even triple? Totally. Absolutely. This is exactly the kind of player that's going to look to make his mark and use his fantasy, use his real life baseball value wherever he can. And he has the ability to steal. The rules are that way. That's how he's going to force his way to even more value and more playing time for the Twins. Composite ADP on Fantasy Pros for him, 450, Nick Gordon. So Mm. free, baby. Free. Let's go. All right, Welsh, back to you for the second base. Who you have? Actually, mine is another one of those guys, just like Ariel's, that we're going to talk about him in this position, but he qualifies at some others. And he's actually going to play a different position, but it's CJ Abrams who should qualify at second and third and shortstop for everybody. But I'm going to line him in here at second base because this actually might even be a better spot that you would want him in. I have loved from day one the sprint speed um, in the minors, even before really paying attention to Corbin Carroll's fast speed numbers. There was this Abrams type speed. Uh, Years, years ago, it was the Buxton speed, and then it became kind of Abrams to me, and he flies around 91st percentile as far as uh, sprint speed goes. Already has a stolen base in spring. He's had a pretty good spring as well, hitting 278, five hits and 18 at bats, and he looks like he's going to have the gig the entire time. He has put up a um, little Cattell Marte-ish in him where he has like high, high hard hit numbers, but his average EVs sit pretty low, which I just think shows like when he starts to tap in, it's going to get there. Uh, the stolen base numbers, I think, is where every projection is just off on him right now. S- similar to Corbin Carroll, I think they're wildly off. ATC is low on the homers at seven, but has 17 stolen bases, which essentially is the highest, not counting like zips, which I think is a really good starting point at 136. He makes good contact. He doesn't strike out a bunch. 16% strikeout rate in the majors last year. He's just got to walk more. Here's a little upside is in that lineup right now, they have Corey Dickerson hitting two, according to roster resource. If he continues to hit well, CJ Abrams will lead off or hit two for this team. And he will run on a team they need to manufacture these runs. So what I like about him is I like the idea that we could get 10 homers, 10 to 12, somewhere in there. And I think 25 with a little bit more upside on the stolen bases because they will manufacture. And this is how he's going to get his job done uh, on the base pass. When he made his pro debut, I was at it out here, the Diamondbacks immediately was trying to steal. It's what he mm-hmm. wants to do at the end of the day. He just has to hit. Looks like he's starting to get into that space, having a good spring. I think CJ Abrams with the stolen base upside is one of those players that's ready to break out. And to uh, I keep talking about Abrams because I think the leash is going to be long Welsh where, you know, he's going to get a chance to fail. And I think that's important because they have no other options there. They have to have him succeed. Yeah, and they're going to Carter players like, come back. We're done exactly. with that. Like, you know, it's his job. So that is always encouraging, too. If you make an investment in a player and there's somebody else that could push for playing time, if that player struggles, they're going to pass him over, a la Jared Kelnick the last couple of years, right, with Seattle Mariners, players like yeah. that. Abrams is the guy they've got to get a return from him to justify the move that they made trading Juan Soto. So that, to me, is – a good enough reason to be patient with Abrams too, but everything Welsh said in terms of upside is there. Let's go to third base here. Let's flip around Welsh. You give me your third base breakout for 2023 and shame on Jason Collette for the shade yesterday that he threw on this player. We're just not having it. We're not here. We're not for having that. It. Jason Collette's gone <laughs> trying to ruin, just trying to, uh, well, I was going to say something in the punch. And if you missed yesterday's well, show, go back and listen. It was a great show. And he brought up a lot of great points on a lot of players that we are very yeah, into I- which is good because it it does remind us, hey, you know, there's a downside here too, which is great. But Welsh and I are going to try to be practically uh, cautiously optimistic here with the Jordan Walker. We need that. We need a video. We need the Fantasy Pros video team to do that video and put Debbie Downer every time he would talk. We'd be like, so who's your bro? here's your bus, Spencer Strider, <laughs> and then just yeah, close it on his face. He was killing us. But Jordan Walker, I tried to not have like rookies on this list because. You know, are they even in a space of breaking out? Sometimes you think about breakouts as like having opportunity, not necessarily going like Jared Kelnick could be one of those players you could throw in here. But Jordan Walker, what the breakout really exists is him being able to go full throttle. He was Julio Rodriguez and he's still it's amazing, by the way. It is March 7th as we're recording this. He is what Julio Rodriguez was in early February of last year. And that 
the just has not caught up. The drafting and the excitement has not caught up because right. we haven't got the official announcement of his playing time. And if he does, we're going to go because this is a big power speed combo player who's having a fantastic spring. He's crushing the ball and he is aligning himself at every opportunity to get the job. And, and the thing that stood out to me from day one was when they moved Tyler O'Neill off. As soon as they moved Tyler O'Neill off, I thought that is just a close, close sign that they want to have that spot open. Right field is where Jordan Walker they're the most comfortable with, and they wanted to find their flexibility, and they want him up rather sooner than later. And I think what the breakout is, is the breakout in your fantasy value, where you're going to get 19 homers, 22 stolen bases in 2022, had a great fall league, hit 300, makes good contact, doesn't strike out a bunch, he can walk, and he can run for a six foot five, 225 pound plus outfielder it's crazy stuff and it is just i know it's reminiscent of julio and i know it's dangerous to talk about but jordan walker is primed to have that breakout and he's not coming at the cost at least yet that's going to break everybody's heart like no, i'm not. i'm corbin carroll corbin like everyone's going to well, love corbin me carroll's going to break my heart you've got the jersey behind your heart. head there but you know what yeah. I'm, i am not right concerned uh, the, the corbin carroll that i watched last year I mean, I see a major league player. I see a guy who's ready to go. Walker has a little bit more. I think. But my to, point is, it, well, because you know, you know, you, you don't have AAA at bats. You don't have that that window. I think the thing is, like you said, it's the value you're getting at Walker. And with Walker right now, even if you get three to four months of productivity, you'll get all six because he does spend some time in the minor leagues, or maybe he struggles, he gets sent down, comes back. There's all these variables, but the cost, as long as you have a that, patient, uh approach to this he could certainly pay off and still be a good investment and that's exactly it 150 plus adp still and i would even admit you know to corbin carroll nfbc just tweeted out uh that he had a 54 adp in like a couple drafts they had just done a 50 there's mm-hmm. a lot of room for disappointment it's hard to have the disappointment but if you get you might get a 2020 season out of jordan walker when he hasn't been announced for the position and he's going to have a big breakout and he's really has the the shot to be a rookie breakout that a lot of people they were expecting but he wasn't priced in that they that he actually was expecting cuz if he was he'd be a top 100 guy Ariel, your third baseman is a fascinating choice because this is a player that I think disappointed a lot of people last year. Then there were some questions about, you know, is this player soft and all these other things. So let's talk about the third base selection for you in the breakout. What do you see from him? I have Alec Bohm or call him Alec Baum, who's going to hit a bunch of homers this year. Um, I don't know why people were disappointed last year. He turned in a $16 performance in a 15-team league. He had 79 runs and 72 RBIs and hit 280. I I had him on a few teams, and I was not disappointed in the least. Uh, I think, actually, uh, listen, ATC projects him to be fantastic this year, and I think he's even better than that. I think he can hit over 20 homers. I was watching him in spring training. He's hitting bombs, and he's not just clearing the fences. He's going dead center. He's going right over. I think he could also put in a few steals. He's he's stolen a couple of paces, a couple of bases in the past, only two last year, but I think that can go up to five, six. I think that the power metrics were unlucky last year. So that's going to really, uh, that's going to really materialize this year. And again, he's a very low, very high, con- sorry, very high contact, low strikeout rate type player. So there is very little downside with him. You're getting a guy at a big discount with upside and no downside. Really? The only downside is he's a terrible fielder. I mean, I was watching him. The, I was watching him the other game, and there was a pop up, you know, just outside the foul line, and he drops it. And I'm thinking to myself, would I have made that catch? And I, I was trying to be honest with myself, and I really think I would have made that catch. It was really, and he and he didn't. So I'm not saying that I belong in the major leagues, but I'm saying that his defense is pretty shoddy. Uh, but his bat, bat is not. So um, the only thing I like to see him improve is his walk rate, only five percent last year, uh, but it has been up to almost nine percent in the past. So if that all comes together, we're talking about a really major good buy here. This is a this is a prime breakout in my opinion. He also about, was like my number one weirdest interview I ever did, by the way. Uh, Just yeah, pointing out really? sure weirdest, weirdest interview I've ever done. But I actually was thinking about t- picking him on this list here, Ariel. I want, I want to know something, Ariel. What about the splits on this player, too? Because against righties last year, 629 OPS, but 10 of his 13 home runs against right-handed pitching. Against lefties, a 935 OPS. Also, the batting average, very different. 352 against left-handed pitching, 253 against right-handed. I mean, 253 is... Okay, but it's more the OPS that I'm curious about. Does that split scare you, especially in those head to head formats, potentially? Because, you know, not being able to hit right handed pitching at a a standard clip there, that can be a big red flag sometimes on a player. 
Yeah, with that in the defense, you know, yeah, it does beg, hey, are they going to get a fill-in guy? But uh, looking at their roster, they have not. I think they want to let him work it out. I think that they have quite a lot of pieces around it. They got Trey Turner in. Um, you know, Harper's going to be back in the middle of the year. I think they're going to go with what they have. I mean, you're right about weird. I, I remember – I can't remember when it was, but they caught him on a hot mic saying, I can't stand this team or something like that. And that oh, was yeah. before they, he, he didn't like Philadelphia, he was, which is yeah. not a good thing to say to Philadelphia. Yeah. Let me tell you. And, I, I lived there for six years. No. Or yeah, it's not something of, you course, say. of course, they fired Girardi, and uh, I think that helped. They sort of made it, it a, an alpena, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he's fickle. He's a little wild, but uh, no, I think I think the value is going to be there. And I, he just locked in this spring. Just three homers already, uh, dead center homers, um, and uh, there's a lot more to come, I think. All right, let's get to the next position here. Let's talk about shortstop. Uh, Welsh, let's go back to you. Who is your shortstop that can break out in 2023? This is probably one of the biggest names. I think this might be the biggest name from name value that's on my list, but he didn't break out. Um, and it's Wander Franco. Uh, Wander Franco, the first month of the season last year, something I really try to keep coming back to. It obviously could be an anomaly, but in March and April of 2022, hit 313 with four homers. He had three stolen bases, was a little bit more aggressive. He doesn't usually strike out as much as well. And he was striking out a little bit more because it looked like he was swinging through the fences, then got hurt. And that kind of just carried through the entirety of the year. And I think that's it's going to go by the wayside long term with Wander Franco. I think we're going to get back. I mean, obviously, the contact skills, I think, speak for themselves as far as um, he doesn't strike out under 10 percent strikeout rate last year, almost a higher walk percentage. He hit 278 even in a struggle time. If you were to project his numbers out, you would essentially be like 12, yeah. 15. Let's just call it 12, 15 on the year, which would be pretty solid. But I think he's ready to take major steps as more of an aggressive power hitter that's going to hit in the middle of the lineup. And I think there's a decent shot we could have a 2015 season uh coming up for Wander Franco in spring he's having a solid spring he's hitting 500 he's got a homer he's got a stolen base he's four for eight you like to see that spring numbers don't necessarily mean anything but you want to see them locked in and Wander Franco has he has an aggressive hitters approach not just like I'm trying to make contact and swing across your body and just hit line drives like he wants to destroy baseballs and I think this year he's going to have a better opportunity to destroy baseballs now that he is healthier and I think he can repeat more of that March April and his ADP Mm -hmm. is going to look a lot better where I've been focusing the last couple episodes of those back end shortstops I don't really like you know Colette didn't like the Anthony Swanson I didn't really either Tim Anderson has a ton of injury issues Carlos Correa all that Wanda Franco is in that area he kind of ends that tier of shortstops that I would really want, even though it's like, oh, it's 15 deep. Eh, it's not really. It's not really. Juan Franco is one of those I would want to make a bet on this year, though. At 22 years old, I think it's crazy for anybody to even think about the notion of giving up on Wander Franco right now. I mean, I'd be all over him. This is the last time you're getting a discount, too. So I'd be buying him in Dynasty. I'd be buying him Keeper Leagues anywhere I could get him. All right, let's move on to shortstop for you. Ariel Cohen, who is grabbing the bat, taking a glove for breakouts 2023? I usually don't pick players who haven't had much major league experience, and I usually don't pick Rockies because they mishandle rookies (laughs) and prospects. But Ezekiel Tovar really looks primed. Uh, Brendan Rodgers pretty much hurt for the year. They had to even import Mike Moustakis in the infield. So Ezekiel Tovar is going to be the starting shortstop. He's going to get all the playing time in the world. And projections are usually not great on on, – Cardi will tell you this all the time. Usually doesn't excite projections, but – uh, ATC is very excited. Almost a 15-15 projection with a 270 average uh, strikeout rate under 20%. Very, very excited about him. So we're talking about power, speed, and average blend. And here's a little secret about Colorado Rockies for this year. They're actually better than you even think. First of all, the Rockies manufacture quite a lot of runs. They were the number one most highest run scoring team in all of Major League Baseball last year. So if you want runs at RBIs, that's the place to be. They also don't have a great pitching staff. So they're going to try to manufacture some runs and steals could be up. But how about the power? Everyone says, well, yep, they play in cores. Well, that's a reason to buy them. But, well, they play in a very tough division. Actually, with the balanced schedule, they're no longer going 10 times to the Dodger Stadium. They're not going Great to point. the Giants Stadium. They're not playing the Padres all those times. They're playing teams in the in the Central, the AL Central. They have a better schedule in better ballparks. The average ballpark factor for a Rockies hitter has gone up 
and, and it was high to begin with. So secret, secret, Rockies hitters are even better than you think this year. And Tovar is primed to break out, and he's still going at a very manageable cost in uh, in drafts this year. So uh, I like the guy. Get him soon, though, because what, since Rodgers has been hurt, he, his yeah, ADP is point. rising. you got to buy now. I hope you're not in a lot of leagues with Stanfield because this is another one of Frank's guys, too. So I hope you guys are separated out. Just I'll saying. be drafting uh, it with him uh, in uh, two weeks in Tout Wars. Oh, so, uh, I can't wait to see that battle to the death. All right, let's talk about the outfielders here on your list. Uh, let's run through the three of them here. Jake McCarthy is the first one, Ariel. Uh, this is a player, ironically, yesterday was on Colette's bust list. So I can't yeah. wait wow. to hear your take on him. So take us through McCarthy first and then your other two outfielders on this list. Let's do them as a as a cluster together. Yeah, McCarthy, this is a gut, gut. Uh, he's going to steal 30, 40 bases this year. He had 23 stolen bases in 321 at bats, and that's just going to continue this year. Batting average, fantastic. He had 283 last year, so he's getting on base. Uh, he's going to bat in the heart of the Diamondbacks lineup, third, second maybe, uh, right right where Corbin Carroll is, Christian Walker, going to have a lot of chances to score runs, a lot of RBIs. Uh, I see categories all across the board. Probably he might even get to 10 homers, so he's not a zero in that stat. So we're talking about, uh, you know, a, a, this is like Starling Marte almost. Uh, and you're getting him not – you don't have to pay all that much for him. I bought him yesterday in in uh, a couple of days ago in the uh, mixed labor auction for like 14 bucks. So he's going for a nice discount. You're going to get a lot of stats out of him. Fantastic buy for McCarthy. All right, who are the other two outfitters you have on your list as well? Yeah, I have uh, TJ Friedel. And uh, or is it Fr- I think Friedel, TJ Friedel, Friedel. and uh, Jose Siri. Uh, TJ Friedel, uh, I also think is very, very interesting. This is a guy who is hitting uh, first in, in the lineup in the Reds. They're not a fantastic team, but that ballpark is amazing. So you got a power speed combo. He's batting first. He hit five home runs in September this year. I love to look at guys who in September really went off. That tells me something about the next year. So uh, that's him. He's going to get the playing time. No one's kicking him out of that spot. And now that Jose Siri, uh, you know, Tampa Bay Rays do a lot of platooning, but he might get some extra playing time. And this guy has uh, 15, 20 ability. So uh, if you're looking for a little spark of power speed blend late in draft, he's going like around pick 330 or so. Uh, Jose Siri give you a little bit uh, of extra uh, accounting stats uh, when you need it. Now, if you're a fan of the show here, you know that uh, Lars Newbar is obviously going to be on Welsh's breakout list for the outfield. But there's another two names on here, too. Brian De La Cruz, Riley Green. Green, I can't wait to hear you talk about. So let's talk about these three outfielders that you have and why Welsh you think these three are going to break out in 23. Yeah, I mean, we'll just get Lars out of the way. I've done it enough, but um, really fantastic interview. I want to point out, uh, Eno Saris did on Rates and Barrels with uh, Lars, where he talked about a lot of the uh, the vest weight vest training he did and barreling. Like that was the big focus because the year before he had worked so much on his hard hit numbers. And we saw that come through, by the way. He had a 46% hard hit rate, which was fantastic. He barreled the ball uh, a really good amount. He had a max EV of 130 and an average of 91.7 on his uh, average exit velocity. And that was the big focus going into last year was just hitting the ball hard. Now, the focus he did in some of his driveline adjustments was the, taking that hard hit and work, working on making sure the contact, the barreling of it. And I just think that he has taken to every step with huge strides. His XBA was like 20 plus points higher than his actual batting average. Should have been closer to around a 250 hitter. Hit 14 homers in 108 games. ATC's got him at 20 homers, the highest of any projection system. It's actually in line with uh, zips, which we all can laugh about as like big, crazy numbers. 20 with six stolen bases and a 243 batting average. And what I would like to point out about that is that is in 129 games. And that is kind of on an average baseline. I don't think it's out of the question that Lars Newbar hits 25 homers and steals uh, 10 bases this year with a decent average. The other two guys, Brian De La Cruz, I've called Brian De La Cruz Teoscar Hernandez light, or you know maybe more of a Walmart version of Teoscar Hernandez. It's going to be about playing time ultimately with him because he has huge hard hit numbers, huge exit velocity numbers. X Woba was in the 90th percentile, 96% XBA from this past year. His XBA was actually 287 when he hit 252. And he's in a playing time thing with Jose San- uh, Jesus Sanchez, which I don't understand. I think if he gets in, 
it's like I said, it's like a Teoscar thing. I think it's 25 homers. You're going to get a handful of stolen bases. And depending where he's hitting in the lineup, he's going to be a massive, massive steal. And Riley Green, the thing I've always kind of banked on with him, he's just a great contact hitter. The power has not necessarily worked out what I'm optimistic about, even though I think they raise the walls while bringing them in. He he's been seen as a better power projected player than uh, Spencer Torkelson. He had 253 this past year. Strikeout numbers were a little bit concerning. I think he's going to be hitting in the middle of that lineup. I think he's got that 15 plus home run power. And I think he's going to be a little bit more aggressive on the base paths. And if the strikeout numbers come down with the ballpark dimension change, Riley Green set for a good prime. And he kind of just stands out to me. These are all three targets of mine, though. I will say Lars is probably on 80% of my teams right now. Brian De La Cruz, probably around 50 that I've done. And when I can get Riley Green, probably like 25%. I target these guys in all my drafts. So this is definitely, uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is. All right, let's get to the pitchers here. And one of Welsh's favorite pitchers is actually headlining the list for Ariel Cohn. So I was mad about that. I know you are. Well, it's nice to hear someone else talk about it. Yeah, no, no, it's good. It's good. Uh, So Jeffrey Springs on this list. David Peterson, who's on my list, who I keep talking about all the time, Ariel, which is the Mets pitching staff has a lot of age in it. This guy performed very well last year. They could use more left-handed starting pitching in that rotation as well. They're starting him down the minor leagues most likely. And I think that's a great opportunity, another free pitcher that you could just kind of stick on your roster and you know you're going to probably get like 20 starts out of him at the end of the day. And then you have George Kirby, another one of our favorites here. So let's talk about Springs, Peterson, and Kirby. Why do you think they're going to break out this year? Well, first of all, I disagree that David Peterson is going to start in the minor leagues because Jose Quintana is going to be out for two or three months with the stress fracture. So he's probably going to make the fifth, the fifth spot in the Mets rotation. Uh, whatever projections are out there right now for 80 innings and 90 innings, uh, up that by about 30 innings or so, at least. I think the Mets are going to get a, a guy who is fantastic slider. I mean, he, he had, I don't know, maybe the second highest whiff rate on his slider last year of all pitchers in the majors, something like that. Uh, so he was fantastic. A uh, lot of strikeouts. I mean, he struck out 126 batters, only 106 innings. We're talking easy hundred, easy 150 strikeouts here from this guy. ERA under control. Now, the walks are a little bit of a problem. Uh, he has not been great with that. So I'm hoping that that, uh, after a nice offseason, gets gets fixed. Uh, and if you have that, we're talking a very, a very exciting pitcher. And you're getting him free right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, the, you know, fantastic. Uh, as far as the others, Jeffrey Spings, um, enormous strikeout rate. His ERA last year, 246 in 135 innings with a 107 whip. You know what a 107 whip does to your fantasy uh, your fantasy numbers? It takes them way, way down. That strikeout rate, 27% last year. It was 35% the year before. Uh, he's a converted reliever, of course. Uh, Jeffrey Springs, really prime. He, I love it when those relievers turn start. Remember Chris Sale? He used to be a reliever. Adam yep. Wainwright used to be a reliever. Uh, these guys are fantastic. So skill, skill, skill. Johan Santana used to be a reliever. <laughs> Santana. George Kirby, uh, I know he's uh, it's only his second year, but I think the innings jump is going to be great. He's going to get to like 160 innings almost. And I can't believe when I saw it, the ATC risk metrics have him as the least riskiest pitcher in all of baseball. So wow. I take his numbers and I just add two, two dollars, two rounds to, to buying him. His control is impeccable. Four percent walk rate. This guy is not getting not having guys on base like Bartolo Colon walks almost. Um, and the strikeouts are right there. So what are you missing? Nothing with this guy. Safe, safe pick. Upside of he's a top ten pitcher upside. And by the way, he was unlucky last year. He had a three thirty one BABIP. Whatever whip he had is going to go down. He's fantastic by very very big breakout guy. Ariel, can I ask? Because I would have I would have definitely did Kirby just real quick. What encompasses the the risk the like the risk management to him? How does how does he become the least risky pitcher as a second year guy? Yeah, so uh, without getting too much into it, um, ATC looks at what's called parameter risk, which is the certainty that we think uh, the true talent is of the true talent. And that goes from surveying a lot of different projections. Projections are very tight on him. Everyone is projecting the same the same way. Manual guys, automated guys, everyone is really has the same grasp on him. Uh, and that in, in, in studying how uh, this is you – know, all uh, when I take a look at, at the uh, major league player pool and you see whenever projections are very tight, you see that it actually adds value to a player. Like there's a legitimate two, $3 bump just from being uh, 
projected in a very tight circle. So uh, that's why I say he's least risky. Not that he's uh, any more health risk than anybody else. He has the same health risk as anybody else, although I think it's lower because of his very nice delivery. Uh, but in terms of true talent projection, I think we're more sure of what he is. And if anything, there's a negative skew. Like there's one projection system that's very low on him and thinks he's terrible. Uh, I know from experience, you can just ignore that. You go by the mass of the crowd. So whatever projection we think, it's higher than you think. Uh, I, I, I think he's a fantastic hit. Very cool. All right, so Springs, Peterson, and Kirby, let's go to your guys. You've got Nick Lodola, Welsh, Reed Detmers, one of my favorite guys, and another player we have yet to talk about. So let's talk about these three. I'm going to tease it, set them up, knock them down. Yeah, so Nick Lodolo, we've, de- we've talked a decent amount about, uh, I've been a Nick Lodolo over Hunter Green guy, even though I love the big strikeout numbers on Hunter Green and the change to the slider. The Everyone made a big deal about the slider with Hunter Green, but we should be making a big deal about the curveball with Nick Lodolo, which had a 46% whiff rate last year, which is just so absurd. He threw it 30% of the time, which was essentially the exact same amount of time he was throwing his fastball. Uh, fastball uh, definitely got hit hard, which is going to be interesting how he runs that mix this year, uh, maybe throwing a little bit more more of a sinker, which didn't have a big whiff rate, but the changeup and curveball, he gets the stuff done with the curveball. His teammates love him. Funny anecdotal thing. I don't know if I've said this on here, but uh, Joey Votto was actually asked by someone I know about, hey, who would you take in fantasy, Hunter Green and Lodolo? And he thought about it, and he went, Lodolo. He, he would go with Lodolo. The pitch mix, I think, really stands out for Nick Lodolo. So uh, I'm a little bit worried about the team context and his ability to break out just because of like wins and run support and stuff like that. But I think he's one of the best pitchers, and the pitch mix is phenomenal. It's going to keep going. Reed Detmers is kind of in this same boat. He kind of changes Arsenal from being like a three-pitch pitcher to a four-pitch pitcher this past year. He's definitely built on command. He doesn't get hit hard outside of the fastball, which I think is really intriguing. And he's one of the few pitchers I've ever seen that have like the five pitches and they're all over a 20% whiff rate. I mean, it's really mixed around. It might not be really one great pitch as far as he just keeps batters um, on their toes. Cause he's going to throw a, a variety of pitches. So I think Reed Detmers is in a really good spot. He's actually also had a pretty good spring. I think he's in a really good spot to take that advancement. Um, I, also the tutelage of Otani, I think will be really interesting to see where he goes as he uptick that change up a little bit. So I like him. And the, the last one that you mentioned you know, it actually came from just watching him in spring, and I think I forgot how much I liked him in the minor leagues. It's Hayden Wisniewski. Um, Hayden, Wisn- Hayden Wisniewski with the Cubs is vying for a spot in the rotation. I don't know if he's going to get it, but I was just really impressed with how he was attacking the zone early on here. His fastball um, is pretty, pretty solid. His slider was actually his number one pitch, though, this past year. Threw it 32% of the time with a 33% whiff rate. Well, big spin numbers as well. Uh, throws a four seam, throws a sinker, cutters in there, and a change of so This is another big pitch mix guy with kind of an inter, uh, interesting like alteration of how he throws. And he also just attacks the zone. 25% K rate this past year with a 5% walk rate feels a little George Kirby ish. And if there's a little bit of a bump up in the K numbers, I think if Hayden Wisniewski gets an opportunity in the rotation, he might be able to be one of the better Cubs pitchers, especially now that Justin Steele uh, is dealing with some injury stuff. I think Wisniewski could be really sneaky. Yeah, he is going at 350 overall. Reed Detmers, by the way, in terms of ADP, also very, very cheap. Um, he is in the two. 50-ish range right now that I'm looking over fantasypros.com. So you're getting a pretty good discount on a lot of these players, and you take advantage of that. Actually, he's at 214. He's gone up in the last few days. So Detmers is starting to rise because a lot of people are talking about him, but Wisniewski and other players kind of, well, basically free right now. All right, well, let's wrap things up. Let's close it out with the closer. Who is the breakout closer for 2023 on your roster? Yeah, my favorite guy to pick on, and he doesn't even have the gig yet, and I think it's dangerous, it's Andres Munoz. That is the uh, guy that I want to get as much investment as I possibly can with just a huge, huge fastball, which is the thing that just kind of gets me going. Uh, He's healthy. Paul Seawald and him both kind of vying for not being healthy. 13.29 K per nine a just barely two a walk per nine, which I think is phenomenal for um, a really big fastball guy like him. He actually had a better XFIP than his ERA, 249 ERA with a two XFIP. And I look at Andres Munoz as the quintessential classic closer. There are so many guys you could depend on at the top end that are not going to break out. That middle end, I think there's a lot of guys that are in rotational issues. Johan Duran and him, 
I feel like you got to take a side. You got to take a side on which is the guy you want to break out. I think Paul Seawald is a solid closer, but what I think they could do and they will do is they'll put him in more of a leverage situation Mm -hmm. as the veteran guy and let Andres Munoz blow by people because I think that is what he ultimately does best. Andres Munoz, I want as much investment as possible with uh, a 100 average fastball. 102 was his average fastball and he throws a, a power slider that is almost at 97 miles an hour. So I'll take that every day you and me both i'm aggressive on him as well he's going to be part of this video i've got the must-haves of 2023 stay tuned for that on our youtube channel subscribe again fancy bros mlb arrow cohen who's the closer for the all breakout team for you this year yeah, and by the way, Munoz uh, is on my uh, labor team that I picked this weekend, along nice. with Duran, and I got to end with Diaz. So I got a lot of saves oh, on my team there. You're doing there good. You go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the only thing is, Munoz, I don't know if he's going to be a leverage guy. He'll, he'll get plenty of saves, but is he going to be full close or full leverage? I don't know. But this guy that I have, I think, is the man. Alex Lang of the Tigers, uh, basically by default. The rest of the Tigers actually stink. Uh, the, the bullpen is horrendous. And that's good because it means that he's more guaranteed the job. He had a 31% strikeout rate last year. His only problem is walks, but hey, that didn't prevent Gregory Soto last year from getting the closer's job and running with it for a couple straight years. Uh, I think Tiger's not going to be a fantastic team, but I think he's being able to, to pull out 20, 25 saves, and you're getting him at a much cheaper cost than anybody else who's guaranteed, even less than Munoz or Duran or any of those guys. It, towards the end, we're talking pick two 30 or so um and you know close saves and closers are hard to get this year because there's just a lot of certain there's only yeah. a little bit of certainty at the mm-hmm. top and a lot of shots and a lot of crappy pitchers lang has the skills to be a closer and uh he's going to be the saves guy so i think it's a safer pick very late uh, safe cheap that sounds like good for an actuary like me so there you go Sounds good. All right, let's recap Ariel's roster at catcher Logan O'Hoppy, the sloppy O'Hoppy. Josh Naylor first, Nick Gordon at second, Alec Bohm at third, then Tovar at short, McCarthy, Friedel, Siri in the outfield, Jeffrey Springs, David Peterson, George Kirby, and Alex Lang to round out the rotation of the bullpen. On Welsh's side, Stevenson at catcher, uh, Jose Miranda at first, CJ Abrams at second, Jordan Walker at third, Wander Franco at short, Lars Newtbar. And Brian Dela Cruz, along with Riley Green in the outfield, then Nick Lodolo, Detmers, Wisniewski, and Andres Munoz rounding it out. So those are names to pay close attention on and get ready to draft them, maybe a little aggressively as well, because some of them are coming at quite a discount. Go get your guys. Go get some of these guys, because the ATC projections are high on them. Go follow our friend as well, Ariel Cohen, over on the Twitter machine at ATCNY. And also uh, be weary of him in a fast pitch softball game. The guy's got an absolute cannon, Watch very out. intimidating. He knocks guys down to the ground. It's it's he's like <laughs> the uh, it's like the Don Drysdale of softball pitchers. You got to see the videos of him on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, also, don't forget to draft assistant with Sync. It's an incredible set of tools that plug right into your drafts wherever you're drafting. Help you make all the right decisions, and you can get it at fantasypros.com slash premium. So go MVP, go Hall of Fame today. Join our Discord. Subscribe to our YouTube channel because leading off is coming around in just a few weeks. It's an amazing time to be alive. This week, we're also going to have the all-sleeper team with Steve Gardner, so stick around for that as well. That'll do it for us, but the story of the game goes on. For the Welsh and Ariel Cohen, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids.